Everybody, welcome back. Uh, Mike Sag from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. This is our very special session for the next hour and a half. We're going to be talking about what the world was like in 1980 and 1981 as what we now know as AIDS emerged on the scene. When we were pulling together this clinical conference, the chairs were talking about how we should do something to commemorate the fact that it's been 40 years since the first cases of AIDS were really encountered. If you think back, it actually there were cases through the 70s, but it didn't really hit the critical mass where people said, whoa, you know, something's happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear that we started to get really embroiled into the AIDS epidemic. And since this meeting was originally planned to be in person in San Francisco, which is one of several epicenters of AIDS back in the 1980s, we thought it would be important to commemorate this anniversary with a look back with people who were here and were instrumental in guiding the response and treating patients and thinking through the issues and developing programs and policies that had uh, that really set the tone for the whole country and for that matter, the world. We could have had other centers. We could have had New York or or Los Angeles, or Atlanta, Miami, Washington, D.C., Chicago. But because we were here in San Francisco, we wanted to narrow in on that. But please understand that I think what you're going to hear from our panelists today is representative of what happened in a lot of areas around the country, and for that matter, the world at the same time. So without further ado, um, I'm going to model this and then turn to our panelists to introduce themselves. Again, I'm Mike Sag from UAB, and in 1981, I was just finishing medical school and getting ready to transition to uh, residency at UAB and had not really seen or heard of AIDS at that point. I'm going to turn to our first guest, Dr. Paul Volberding. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so in 1980, I was finishing my oncology fellowship uh, uh, doing research with Jay Levy, who would later be one of the discoverers of the, of the AIDS virus, um, and was offered a job uh, at San Francisco General Hospital, a clinical job, uh, taking care of cancer patients. Um, to start on July 1st, 1981, um, and the first Capacies patient at that hospital was admitted just like the day before. Yeah. Yeah, Watch so that. I, uh, right, Watch right that first as it started. Marcus had seen patients already with KS, but that was my first one. Right. Um, let me finish here, and I'll go to Marcus. This is Allison Moad. You know, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and where you were in 1981. Hi. In 1981, I was just finishing. 81. 81. 81. <laughs> no, that's 81. I was just finishing my, <laughs> my bachelor's degree in nursing at Sonoma State University, but I was working per diem in, Cal in San Francisco and um, especially at San Francisco General, as well as at, on a psychiatric unit and in a hospice yeah. and trying to figure out exactly where I wanted to land. Yeah, and it just sort of defined itself for you. Yes, it did. As it turned out. As we've already alluded to with us today uh, by Zoom or some other panelists, I'm gonna start with Dr. Marcus Conant who uh, was here in 1981. Mark, uh, give us a snapshot of who you were and what you were doing back in 1981. Thanks, Mike. In 1981, I had finished my residency in dermatology at UCSF 18 years before that. So I had been in practice for 18 years across the street from the medical center. In 1981, I got a call from Al Friedman Keen, another dermatologist saying, We've got a case of Capsi sarcoma here. As a matter of fact, we've got a bunch of them in gay men. Are you seeing that in San Francisco? And I said, no, but I'll ask tomorrow at Grand Rounds. And I did. And later that morning, I saw my first case because we already had a case admitted at uh, UC. So that was my first case. And I started seeing cases. That was uh, April the 1st, 1981. In retrospect, as you alluded to, I had already seen at least one case a close friend uh, who had come down with a splitting headache, was admitted to the Veterans Hospital, went into coma that night and died six months later of tuberculosis of the brain. Mm. Clearly a case of AIDS that we didn't recognize what it was. Right. We also are very happy to have Dr. Kathleen Clannon with us who is in the Bay Area. Uh, 
Dr. Clannon, where were you uh, in the 1981 uh, era? So 1980 was my first year in medical school at UC Davis. The first inkling I ever remember about HIV was after the MMWR and seeing tubes of blood in the hospital that were labeled with as many different kinds of biohazard labels so that you could hardly see whose blood it was. And then ultimately I went to Oakland, to the county hospital in Oakland, which is called Highland Hospital in 1984 to do my internship and residency. And that's where I first met people who were living with HIV. And rounding out our panel is Dr. Michael Reyes, uh, who was here at that time as well. Michael, uh, what's your story? So in 1981, actually, I was uh, just preparing to start medical school in 82 at UC Irvine, and um, I was hearing all about the work of Paul Voberding and Marcus Conant and watching the publications starting to emerge. And as a newly out gay man, um, you know, I was going through my basic science lectures and hearing about, you know, these new things, T cells and B cells and, you know, you know, risk stratification versus anal receptive, anal, um, you know, penetrative, all this new vocabulary that we were coming up with. And so that early era was me in medical school learning about it. And like Dr. Clannon, I then went on to do res, uh, residency in family medicine at um, UCSF Fresno and have stories about building HIV services there. And Dr. Cheever, you're going to co-moderate with me, but you also have a connection out here. Uh, maybe you can start with that, and then I'll turn it over to you from, uh, for the first question. Sure. So in uh, 1980, I was, in, medic I was in, uh, in high school, and like a lot of high schoolers, we were all worried about herpes. <laughs> that was the big thing. So HIV was nowhere in our, our minds. Um, I did make it out to San Francisco. San Francisco in 1990 to do my internal medicine residency where I had the pleasure of working with Paul Paul Ridding. He was one of my very earliest attendings out there. Um, so yes, yeah, so it is, it's great to hear about where you all were at that time. And I don't know if um, Paul or Marcus want to talk a little bit about what was going kind of in the medical scene in San Francisco at that moment. So uh, prior to in the seventies or just when they, in the early eighties, like what was happening um, sort of culturally or uh, from a sort of medical point of view, or were those two intersected in the Bay Area? Well, since I had been in practice for a long time, let me comment on that first. It, in, in 1980, the internists were telling us that infectious diseases had been conquered. We already, by 1980, we already had the we, we, we knew we were going to have, it happened actually in 82, a treatment for the first viral disease. We had a cyclovir coming along. And so, so we had broken the, the gap. We, you know, we, we now uh, had some way of attacking a virus and killing it. Uh, Trudy Elian had done her work and uh, actually herpes was my field before AIDS. And so I was doing some of the first clinical trials on a cyclovir uh, in that period of time. So the, the feeling was complacency. We don't have to worry about infectious disease. But your audience needs to know that there were no infectious disease doctors in private practice. Every infectious disease doctor, at least on the West Coast, was hospital-based, just like a radiologist. You would admit the patient to the hospital, and then the infectious disease specialist would come see them. So that's been a huge change in the last 40 years, because Mike and others now all have practices where they see patients in, in the university practice or in their own private practice. But something else needs to be said in terms of what was happening. Remember, in 1980-81, we, we had telephones. We had radio, we had television, we had copy machines, but we did not have the internet. We did not have Google. We, we did not have word processors. If the typist made a mistake, she had to tear out the page and retype the entire page. We, we had none of the tools that we have now that has absolutely revolutionized the way we think about medicine and practice medicine. We didn't have clinicaltrials.gov. We, library systems have changed totally. And so there was a completely different way of interacting with information, 
and with your patients. And later I'll come back and talk about what it was like in that first two or three years, particularly when we didn't know what was happening. We didn't know what was causing it. We didn't know who was going to get sick from it and who was going to live or die. We had no treatments. We were frightened. The patients were frightened. And physicians in San Francisco were frightened. That's one of the reasons that dermatologists ended up taking care of lots of HIV patients was the average internist didn't want people with an unexplained cough or purple bumps on their skin sitting in their waiting room. But yeah, so um, uh, as Marcus uh, uh, said, uh, my memories are, first of all, I was in, in the early days, so 78 to 81, uh, living in Bernal Heights, a neighborhood in the Mission District, sort of the outer Mission District. But, and I would drive all the time to uh, Parnassus, to the main UCSF campus, where my fellowship was based. And a fellowship in oncology is very erratic. You're working very long hours, day and night. And I would drive this straight line shot from Bernal Heights to Parnassus was through the Castro. Um, and so I would often at, very late at night see lines of people outside bars, uh, bathhouses, and as a kind of having moved here from Salt Lake City, it was like, huh, what's happening here? Um, and we realized that, you know, there had been, before the AIDS epidemic started, this huge societal uh, revolution where gay men were coming out, were coming to San Francisco, um, and, and we're getting infectious diseases. Uh, we're getting sexually transmitted infections. Uh, going to the city clinic, uh, still uh, a very proud STI clinic. Um, and so the, the, the background of this uh, was that there were a lot of people uh, engaging in practices that in retrospect, obviously were capable of transmitting uh, this new virus. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it was all happening as we just sat and watched. I think we can focus just the first couple of questions here uh, to, to Paul and Mark, because we're gonna talk about those early er eras and that era. And then as we move into the later 80s, we'll bring in uh, Kathleen and, and Michael. But to pick up on this, uh, Mark, you were doing a great job telling the history of medicine, especially with Gardadi, but dermatology used to be called dermatology and syphilology, right? And so right. STIs were right up, were, were right what you were, were how you were trained, correct? That's right. And, and uh, dermatology is still essentially dermatology and syphology. They call it venereology in Europe. The European dermatologists still talk about infertility. They talk about gonorrhea. They talk about syphilis. But Americans didn't want their kids to be syphologists, for God's sake. And so in 1942, when penicillin became available, the syphology was dropped from the title. But dermatologists of my era still were trained in sexually transmitted diseases. So picking up where Paul left off, um, the late 70s with bathhouses, a lot of bars, a lot of uh, just sexual activity, and especially in the gay men and the Castro, what were you seeing clinically, uh, either in your training or, or in some of the clinics you were working in terms of, uh, I think what it used to be called bowel syndrome or gay bowel syndrome? Yes. Well, uh, we saw a lot of gay bowel syndrome, but my, my private practice at that point was a referral practice because I was running the dermatology inpatient service in, in 1981. So the vast majority of my patients were patients I had cared for when they were in hospital with generalized exfoliative dermatitis or pemphigus or pemphigoid or really serious dermatological problems. And I wasn't seeing the average gay guy on the street, even though I lived around the edge of the Castro and worked at UC across the street from the Parnassus campus. I saw very few gay men in my private practice. What I was seeing were lots of herpes patients. And mm -hmm. most of those were young girls who were terrified that they had herpes and they were being told they had to tell their partners that they had this infectious disease. And of course, the minute they told their partners that they had it, they didn't have that partner anymore. And so it was a huge practice of young girls with, with recurrent genital herpes. And it was a lot much as much an emotional practice as right. it was a physical practice. 
we, we, sure, we saw the occasional case of gonorrhea drop in the office. You saw the occasional case of syphilis in the clinic, in the dermatology clinic, unfortunately. And I had run the clinic for about four years. We saw the occasional case of syphilis, but dermatologists did not want to see the cases of gonorrhea. And so they were being sent to the, to the just the family doctor. And so if you don't see a whole bunch of cases of gonorrhea, you're not going to see many cases of syphilis. Right. So, Paul, I'm going to one more question. I'll pitch it back to Laura. But um, now, I think Allison has a point. Or Allison, sorry. I, I just want to build a little bit off what each of something that each of you said. Um, one thing was yes, the Castro. When I had moved out from New York City in 1979 and I lived with a gay, very, very dear, wonderful gay friend of mine in the Castro. So I saw that, but I saw not only that activity, but the tremendous amount of, uh, of pride, of affirmation in being gay. And I think it's really important to mention that when we, when we talk about, even about the clinical, a clinical picture, because healing and curing is not, it's not only, doesn't only take place in a laboratory, in a, you know, in a, in a doctor's office. It's a two-way street. There's a lot of sharing there. And what I saw, what, what I did, didn't necessarily recognize then, but I can in retrospect, was the beginning of this very strong community with a very strong identity who would learn how to advocate for themselves where perhaps um, in, in treatment settings where perhaps they had not been treated well before. And then, um, and then um, just talking about the climate of fear, as a nurse, I, I feel, I want to say that uh, the staff was so afraid. They were so afraid of the disease. They were afraid of getting it themselves and they were get afraid of getting it and bringing it home to their families because you couldn't really tell them much. I mean, you could sur one could surmise, one couldn't tell them definitively as their fears needed to be told about the roots of, root of transmission. And, uh, and then you also saw the emergence of people like ourselves, yourselves, ourselves, who were very, very dedicated to this work, to this type of care. So that, that all, I think, set the stage for what unfolded. Yeah, let's, let, let's stay with you and just kind of fast forward a little bit. You're at San Francisco General Hospital, we're now moving in to October, November, December. The units are starting to fill in. The ERs are showing up with the cases that of the people you just talked about. How did your role transition from being kind of a contract nurse to a more dedicated, focused inpatient nurse at San Francisco General? Well, I, you know, I was... I was a per diem nurse, and it, it, things were very different in those days. Basically, I had showed up, shown my license, and I was hired, you know? So, uh, and I, as a per diem nurse, I didn't get very much information. I didn't, uh, um, I didn't hear very much, but what I saw were these men isolated in rooms at the back of the units. And that's actually in what was actually in one of those rooms that I first met, met Paul and I'd love to, I'm gonna tell an anecdote about that at some point, <laughs> but, uh, I, I found that the nurses were very afraid. My fellow nurses, they were, they How were scared. I, I wasn't afraid. For one thing, I didn't carry the stigma that they felt towards these patients, these guys, you know what they do, you know what they're about. I, I had to say, no, I mean, what, what are you talking about? I, this, this was my community in a way. These were people that I loved and people that I cared about. So I, I wasn't afraid of them. And that took away a level of fear to begin with. And I wasn't, I was hearing my friend's fear and concerns. So I was hearing more in the community than I was hearing uh, in the hospital, than I was getting information. And so uh, if anything, I was, I was driven to help as, you know, as a nurse. And then when I heard that the unit was opening, there were signs posted and someone actually told me about it. I thought, yeah, that's for yeah. me. I was just, I was just that's hoping awesome. and, and I was, I was and, one of and the I first. Think we, you know, we see that now, even today, there are people who are just drawn 
to HIV care, right? Those are folks who, um, who are sitting in on this conference. Laura? Yeah, no, I, I was just interested too in, in learning more because early on you talk about the fear, but also we did not have universal precautions in those days, right? I mean, it wasn't like gloves for everything you do. The people were sticking their hands, uh, dentists were sticking their hands in the mouths of people without gloves on. And, and just can, you, can any of you reflect a little bit more on that and sort of how that played in or, or how that changed or didn't change quickly in this, in this time? Yeah, I mean, we didn't, there, there were no universal precautions in those days. Um, I remember thinking, how could I possibly do an arterial stick uh, with gloves on? You know, it's so delicate. You have to feel the pulse and the needle has to go right under your thumb and, or your finger. Um, of course, craziness. That was one of the most dangerous uh, procedures ever. Uh, there's always blood. Um, but I do remember being afraid. And our first son was born, you know, literally two weeks before I saw my first patient. And so we were having, and Molly, my wife was uh, active in AIDS care. And so it was like all of these issues, you know, not, not afraid in a, in a daily, you know, day to day, minute to minute sense, but this fear kind of hanging over. You dreamed about things. it. Things I dreamed about it yeah. a lot, yeah. And, and just one other thing, and I'll shut up. But um, the other thing that, I, that I've talked about a lot, and, it, and it's a really important message, especially in building programs, is that I was used to taking care of you know, county cancer patients, often recent immigrants, uh, often you know, minimal social connections, but almost always with a family that, that I recognized, you know, a husband, a wife, whatever. Um, in our early... AIDS patients didn't have families. Uh, the families were estranged in many cases. Uh, but I quickly, I think mean, we all quickly realized that there was a family. It was an amazing family and it was the community that these people were, were part of. Um, and so the, the idea of healing in the community and care in the community was something that was hugely important. I, I know it was in San Francisco, I'm sure it was everywhere. Yeah, I thought it, you know, it absolutely was. So uh, I want to sort of fast forward this at some point, but before we get past that, just briefly, the volume. How did, how did the volume appear to you? How did you deal with it? Um, the number of cases, the, the personal agony of not having, not having anything that you could do, except a lot of times uh, hand-holding and uh, just comfort care. Uh, maybe just briefly, if you could tell an anecdote might be good, just a couple of stories that highlight the pressure you were under just to provide the care and the, that incredible feeling of helplessness that you didn't have much to offer. Um, Marcus, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, well, two, two thoughts there immediately. Um, the, the volume started slow and then picked up very rapidly. We started a clinic at, at UC uh, at the first. And we sent notices to all of the dermatologists in town saying that if you see a case of Kaposi sarcoma, we're interested in studying this, please send them to us. And so the doctors didn't want them in their offices. So they were more than happy to send them to us right away. So within the first year, we started seeing a huge volume of patients. And Paul can talk about that because he and I ran a clinic and we would see those patients with people like Jay Levy and discuss those cases. And this was during the first three years of the epidemic. So the, the volume grew rapidly um, during that, that period of time. But I, I wanna refer back to the homophobia you were referring to earlier. Remember in this period, we're talking about the first two or three years, homosexuality was still a crime in half the states in the United States and the District of Columbia. You would go to prison if you were caught engaging in homosexual activity. And so one of the reasons that gay men were feeling liberated and moved to New York and San Francisco and, and places in Florida and elsewhere, uh, New Orleans, what was because they weren't being prosecuted and persecuted in, in those areas. We tried to get the New York Times to discuss condom use because at least we could talk about condoms as a way of protecting yourself. And the letter I have from the New York Times said, remember, we're a family newspaper. We can't talk about condoms in the New York Times. 
and uh, later if you're interested, I'll talk to you about how, how we got around that. And the final thing is about what you could offer the patients. And it's true. We had no treatment. We didn't know what to do. As I said earlier, we didn't know what was causing it. But the one thing you can always give patients is hope. Not necessarily hope that they'll live through this thing even, but hope for a better tomorrow, hope perhaps to die without being in pain, hope to see their family again, hope to reconcile with that family. So the one thing that we were able to give the patients early on was hope. And something that all of your doctors listening need to know is regardless of the problem, you always have that in your armamentarium. Allison, what was it like on the inpatient? Let's fast forward a little bit. Okay. I mean, I could go on and on about yeah. this. Okay. So uh, just, just I to do tag hear on. from Kathleen and Mike. Yeah. yeah, well, just, yeah <laughs> just, to, slow, just to tag on to what you just said. We, we can offer them hope and and we, those are at the bedside, you, all of us as, as care providers, we can tell them that we care. We can recognize their humanity. And I, I, just, I just want to make this explicit. I'm, I know that, you, that you've done this, but I think, it, I think it needs to be said time and time again, because it's a great gift and an important one to recognize someone else's humanity and to come to them from that place, to see them, to care for them. Then um, for us, for myself, I think what we came to was we have to do the best that we can by these guys. And we were, our patients were, for the most part, gay men. We, we just have to do the very best that we can. So we could do things like recognizing their families where their families were not recognized. They're, they're real families. Their families of the heart where those families were not maybe not recognized in other settings. We could hear them. We could hear, listen to what was important to them, and we could follow up on it. So that here's my anecdote with Paul. And I would like to know how you learned this, and you must have learned it because you are a humanitarian and you listen to people. But as a per diem nurse, I went into a room once, and there was a doctor. Didn't know him. Never, never seen him before, and he was obviously talking to this young man about end of life issues, about making decisions about his, his death, how he wanted things to be handled. And I immediately started to leave the room because nurses were not part of those discussions in those days. And Paul said to me, stop, man, he didn't know me either. He said, nurse, you need to hear about his wishes as well, because everyone needs to be aware of them. And we all need to be having these discussions. This is, I mean, that was so brilliant. It's it, perhaps today, it's something that we, that we do, that we understand, that we have the tools for, the language for, and the volition to do. But in those days, I mean, I went back to New York in 85 and my grandmother was Dot was basically dying, and I said, "Is she in no code?" And they said, "She doesn't have cancer." You know, it was it. It was she was ninety one. It was a different. Yeah. It was just a different time, and um, to recognize the importance of the of um, the manner of death, the, the last days of someone who was in, going to die, was was something that we could do. So uh, one really quick thing, uh, Mike, was, uh, and I think uh, younger audiences probably, I'm, I'm sure, do not really fully understand this, but every person that I saw in my clinic, because they, they only came when something was wrong, either they felt sick or they developed a capacies lesion or something else, everyone died. Every last person that came into our clinic with any kind of symptoms died uh, because we had no, no treat. We didn't understand what was going on. We didn't know. So kind of understanding the social setting was really the main thing that we had to do. Um, and so we, I think we learned how to do that. Yeah. So, so I was just gonna turn it over to Kathleen and Mike Full and just ask if there's something that they think about these early days that we haven't covered that they've been thinking about as we've been having this discussion. Only the, you know, only the people, the faces, you know, the, the stories, 
um, the people that were lost. So, you know, I, I was working in the clinic, uh, the HIV clinic, I was the main clinician. Um, in terms of volume, we started in, in 1988 with 150, uh, room for 150 people, but there was a plan to increase that um, by the Board of Supervisors, and we were up to 500 within a year. They were mostly young Black men, very young Black men, who didn't have their, their families of origin, had, they had really complicated relationships with them, and how painful it was they would come, you know, there'd be an afternoon, just half a day where we'd see 17, 20, 25 people. And, you know, they would sit in front of me on the, on the exam table and we would both be terrified. Is this the time that there's gonna be a fever? Is this the time that there's gonna be something new happening that there's absolutely nothing I can do anything about? And that, that ter we were sharing that terror and some, some days nobody was in that boat, but some days a lot of people were. And these were young men who we lost before they had a chance, before they had a chance to be who they were gonna be, to be the leaders, the lovers, the fathers, the artists, um, the doctors. Um, we lost so many people so young out of that generation. And there was no, it felt like there was no good way to bear witness to that. Um, you know, in Oakland, these were young men whose families were ashamed in many cases of what they had died of and the ability to celebrate what their lives were and could have been was really limited. So the, the impulse to bear witness, I, you know, my patients drew pictures, you know, in, when, when they were waiting for me, oftentimes really a long time in the exam room, you know, I have those still. I, I have those still and tapes, you know, of them talking. There's no way that anybody who was not there at that time, I think, could really, really, really feel, you know, what that, what the amount of that loss, relentless loss. There was one year in 1992 when there were 200 of these precious young men who left their, lost their lives, who were just in my clinic. Um, and I, that, you know, changed, it changed my life in, in a lot of different ways, some good, some bad. Um, uh, but, you know, what it did to their lives and their families' lives is orders of magnitude greater than what, you know, what the experience was for any of us. And I would follow on that with, um, you know, I graduated and went to residency in a large urban center in the middle of a, a very large rural agricultural valley in California. And when I arrived at my residency, I was ready to do my share for the HIV care system. There was none. No one was thinking about it. I did get to, you know, latch on to a really fantastic ID doc faculty member who mentored me and said, you know, I'm not, this isn't my thing, but I will help you and make that happen. And we just rolled up our sleeves and started building HIV services in a public hospital because everybody was going to private practice and private practice was getting overwhelmed with infectious disease. And I was coming into this as a person who saw my faculty members at my medical school die. Faculty members at my medical school die, gay men, male faculty members. And then I come up and then my friends are all dying. And, um, and then I become kind of this community confidant for a very stigmatized community where people will come to me privately and ask me and roll up their pant leg and say, I've got this purple stuff all over my leg. Do you think that's serious? And that was kind of my life uh, for uh, this next period. How did you deal with that, Michael? You know, um, I had somebody retrospectively tell me that um, you didn't have a mentor. You, you, you had a clinical mentor, but you didn't have a mentor who was really looking out for me. I will say my department chair was looking out for me, but I didn't have like a lot of people to talk to. And I knew I was in a different culture when I showed up at the hospital and the nurses were trying to fix me up with female nurses. So I'm like, okay, they're not reading the room here. <laughs> in the way the room was read when I came from Southern California. And I respect that and, and respected that. But um, 
it was very hard. And I, I actually did burn out in, in the early 90s and came to Berkeley and did my master's in public health. And fortunately also, I joined the AIDS Education and Training Center in 1989, and that plugged me into peers everywhere, including Dr. Clannon. So the time, as I knew, is going by very fast. So let's move forward to go from the period of kind of hand-holding provision of hope as best we could, preparing people to die, to therapeutics. Um, so Paul, I might start with you because you were right in the heart of the AZT, but maybe just briefly go through that transition and what that was like as you signed people up for clinical trials offering this yeah, tangible yeah. hope. Well, I mean, any one of us on this panel could take up any of these questions and run for an hour <laughs> easily, right? Um, my first clinical trial was with alpha interferon in 1982, actually, Never uh, had with patients American. that were referred from Marcus's practice to me at, the, at San Francisco General. That, that was one of our big influxes of patients, actually, with these arrangements that we made. Patients never were transferred from Parnassus to SFGH, but <laughs> this was a different, uh, different situation. Now, so, um, the, in, in the, as we saw more and more patients and more and more devastating deaths, um, people got really freaked out and, and desperate. And this, this whole alternative therapies thing, the Dallas Buyers Club and all that, um, because people needed something, they needed hope and, and they re really wanted more than just me saying something. They wanted to think that they were doing something actively for themselves and they, took everything and you know a lot of it was crazy some of it was charlatans uh, but when we finally started having uh, some science behind the virus uh, to give us AZT with all of its warts sorry Marcus I shouldn't talk about warts in a negative way um, <laughs> that's okay I'm beyond warts at this point <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, with all of its many, many imperfections, it was the start of, of what then became kind of a pretty rapid development of, of what ultimately were effective treatments. But people were so desperate. Mm -hmm. um, people hated AZT. People were desperate to have AZT. Um, uh, I remember giving lectures in the community, and if you were unlucky enough to, for your lecture to be either at 4, 8, or 12 o'clock, all the pocket beepers would go off because everyone was taking their drugs every four hours. That's a scene in rent, actually. Yeah, you see tea break. Uh, um, and it was and it was true. So so people didn't love it, but they were they were desperate. Others uh, experiences just uh, things that flash as you hear as you think back to the time when therapies were starting to become available. Well, one of the one of the things that it that it was like in, you know, for me in Oakland, that was a little bit of a foreshadowing of the COVID situation is that, um, you know, my patient group was very suspicious about these treatments. Um, they, were, they were not comfortable signing up for, for clinical trials uh, for all the reasons that we know. Um, and so, you know, the, so one good side of that was that they, they mostly were not pretreated, you know, by the time um, highly active antiretrovirals came along, they mostly had not been through the, you know, the serial monotherapy or, or, or dual therapies that many others had been. Um, but the downside was when we did have these highly active therapies, they were still kind of in, you know, wait and see mode and they didn't have time to wait. So the, how do we convince people, you know, what is it, how do we connect with people and convince them that, um, you know, that this is not like the ACT or the other things that we've seen before. This is really a different order of thing. And it is something that they have a right to, and that, you know, that, that, that in a way, um, in, in holding back and taking longer to go on it, they are reproducing Tuskegee by delaying therapies rather than by, by grasping, you know, the fact that there were questions. So that was a really tough, you know, moment of trying to figure out how to how to talk to people, how to engage trusted voices, how to, you know, all the things that we've had to do recently with COVID in terms of vaccine. And I would add that um, 
you know, stigma, which we've been talking about forever. And 40 years later, stigma is still driving this pandemic, um, the COVID pandemic, um, people were coming to, to care in the Central Valley of California desperately late in their, their course. And, and even when therapeutics became available, people were not coming. It was a different kind of volume thing. People were coming from the Valley up to you guys in San Francisco. Yeah. But um, I'm just shocked. And I do a lot, I did a lot of global work with HRSA and and stigma is alive and well all around the world and still here and it's heartbreaking. Mark, go ahead, Alice. Well, and, and it's life-threatening as, as you're yeah. saying really, because it means that people are, have had such negative uh, experiences with the healthcare system and are so distrustful that they don't get the education they need. They can't take, learn about preventive measures that they could take and let, and then, they don't get treated they, or they delay seeking treatment until they're very, very ill. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's life-threatening, it's heartbreaking. And haven't we learned, we are still seeing it unfold now. One of the things that I've learned in Alabama, but it's true all over the country, um, is the notion of how we're raised and especially in the rural Southeast, um, and especially in pockets where church is the center of the universe of that community and going to Sunday school at very early ages and reading Leviticus and trying to uh, incorporate that as a rule, but their feeling and their, 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 who they are as a person is counter to that. And I think that to me, at least in our neck of the woods, that's the root of the stigma in the sense that it's not so much other people looking at someone and saying, you've got this, although that happened but it's a lot of internalized stigma. Uh, I don't want anyone to know about this. And I think that did lead to a lot of the delays in care and it still is today. Mark, let me segue over to you. I want Laura to get in too, but b before we leave this topic a little bit, activism was important. I mean, it was critical. It's how we move forward as fast as we did. And you were definitely in the heart of that, uh, both in, in the community itself, but also as a leader. Um, can you summarize maybe in a couple of minutes what that was like and what the legacy of that activism is? Yeah, the, the activism, I was involved in it in that I and some colleagues started what became the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. But individuals like Marty Delaney were really pivotal in organizing large numbers of gay men and then knowing where they had to put the pressure. The pressure had to be on the FDA. And, and, you know, what had to happen was how the FDA looked at this community and looked at the drugs that were being proposed and, and uh, de developed. Um, because, you know, in those days, a new drug, well, if it took 15 years, who cared? Well, we, we didn't have 15 years because all of our patients were dying anyway, and they were all going to be dead within 15 years. And so you had to totally change the way we approved drugs, got them into the system, uh, did, did the clinical trials and got them to market. And individuals like Marty Delaney were really pivotal in making that happen. And that can't be said enough. And of course, lots of gay men did lots of things which were uh, you know, very upsetting. I remember Diane Feinstein calling me into her office one time and saying, you know, they're standing there uh, on Castro Street waving dildos at me as I drive home. Well, unfortunately, you know, th that's rude, but that's what it took was our leaders understanding that people were willing to go out and do rude things or block traffic. One evening on the Golden Gate Bridge, you couldn't get home to Marin and it caused a huge to do. But that kind of activism called, uh, brought attention to the problem and then began to bring in the press, bring in political leaders. They began to realize that quote, there was a gay agenda and the gay agenda was you're going to address this disease or we're going to do everything we can to see that you're not reelected. And unfortunately, that's what it took early on to get the clinical trials done. I, I wanna uh, sort of uh, feed in on that a little bit. So the Ryan White Pro HIV AIDS program, the, uh, the Ryan White Care Act was passed in 1990. But even prior to that, I think, um, in the HIV arena, we'd already developed a model of care that was very patient focused and include enabling services and 
Can anyone reflect on how or why that happened? Because it seems like even today, when we talk about the kind of care we need to give people, people talk about, well, this model of care we could have, and they say, oh, we do that in Ryan White already. So it's still like one of the only models out there where we really have this integrated uh, system of care. Well, and it well, Paul should of, talk, all right, Paul should really talk to that because he did that. Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a great, uh, it's a great issue, Laura, and, uh, and you were around as this was, uh, this was happening, but I, I, I was flashing on what Kathleen said earlier, um, and, and, and Michael as well, that, you know, none of us had a rule book. Uh, we were just making it up, and <laughs> we didn't have great strategic planners coming in and saying, you know, you need this many nurses, and this, you know, you need a pharmacist, you need, we just did it, um, and it worked out. Um, and we evolved a system of care that really was patient oriented and community based and incorporated research as well as care. And, and it, but it was organic, it was sloppy. I mean, I think I, our finances were not so good. Uh, I think um, I never knew. They weren't. Uh, <laughs> but but we, we were doing the best we could given the situation. I just want to toss in another name here of somebody who could easily be on this panel, Donald Abrams, who was another oncologist turned HIV doc, um, but who given uh, Mayor Feinstein's um, uh, urge, uh, started research in the community with community physicians. Um, to that point, all the research was, you know, tucked away at San Francisco General Hospital and, and some at Parnassus, but, um, but the community docs were very involved in this as well. And, and many of them had a lot of, uh, of AIDS patients and they wanted to participate in the research. And so this idea of community involvement and, and, and on top of the model that we already had was a, was a very important one. And I think that, that, that sometimes gets forgotten. Mm -hmm. I can talk a little bit about how things unfolded on the inpatient unit at San Francisco General. And uh, it was, once again, out of this need to give good care and out of need. So as, as the num so first of all, from the beginning, the community wanted to be there and they showered us with goodies. So they made, so their presence was known and their eagerness to help. But, um, and we did incorporate them as best we could. We started a unit specific um, volunteer group. We in, you know, invited people to participate, to see the patients uh, and try to uh, set all of that up within the hospital guidelines that were already uh, established. But a very important factor was discharge planning. I mean, uh, we tried, our patients came in again and again, you know, they didn't just, if, if they were lucky. And we wanted them to be able to go home if they still had a home. As soon as, as soon as they could. So we would try to liaison with the communities. Well, those communities were, were seeing the unfolding of the epidemic as well. And they were changing their services and they would start visiting the unit. And then, so then the idea was, well, why don't we have a weekly discharge planning meeting? And why don't we go and look at every patient on the unit and see how close they are to discharge, what they might need to be, uh, what, what might need to be in effect, what support systems might need to be in effect for them when they go home. Um, and then, then it became like, and how can those be developed? And so it, it just helped, kept growing. People, people were eager to come to the unit and to do this. And then we were like, okay, what about other patients in the hospital who aren't on the unit? And then that also saw a rise to facilities for people who didn't have a home, like coming home hospice, where patients could go so that they didn't have to languish in the hospital in their last days. So, so that there's an example. And I think that's a perfect segue back to your question, Laura, because um, to me, as I understand the origins, the basis of the Ryan White Care Act, it was because hospital systems in urban settings around the country were being overwhelmed with uh, cases in the hospital, they had no place to go and they needed discharge planning and they needed things, places to go. The, and the, the Congress came together in a bipartisan way, which happened back then, um, 
And they actually created this, um, this incredible program to support uh, medication provision, but also care. And it was done in a decentralized way where the, the individual large urban centers would get a, 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 an allocation of dollars that they would locally come up with a plan and distribute mostly to support some inpatient, mostly is all outpatient focus so mm -hmm. that right. flow of patients could get out of the hospital and go in. And, and again, I think a lot of people who are tuning into this maybe didn't understand the power of, of what drove uh, the original Ron White Care Act. And then, of course, uh, the other part of the country where I live um, said, wait a minute, we don't have hospitals bursting at the scene, but we have a lot of people who are in need of care. And, and that care wasn't being provided. So part C was developed and then of course, part D uh, for kids. And so that, that is, that's how it all started. And that's what we're celebrating uh, as a huge success through this conference and through the work of the Ryan White uh, uh, care plan. Um, so we've only got <laughs> a, a little bit of time left. Uh, I'm wondering if we could talk about things in terms of lessons that you all have learned especially as it might apply to this current epidemic. Um, you know, uh, what I've heard already is activism uh, as pushing the, the domains. We heard about people desperate for uh, therapies. And as you were talking about going out, well, I'm thinking hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, and some <laughs> other things like that. Um, and uh, that's happened. And then uh, Marcus, you talked about Martin Delaney, who started to go a little deeper, this parallel track that patients didn't have time to wait for a clinical trial to come fully to fruition. And so the ability of people to have access to therapy as trials were going on or before things got full approval, that in essence is early use authorization yeah. that we're seeing right. now. Um, so what are some other things uh, that you guys can think of that might be legacies, uh, patient centered care. Uh, well, I mean, I yeah. think the EUA is the is the most obvious one. It goes right to what Marcus was saying about about activism, because that would not have happened in the HIV epidemic if it weren't for the activism. Um, I, I think that among the lessons and parallels, I, I think the first of all, flooding a problem with with money uh, for science. Uh, results in progress, um, and there's a lot of money spent on 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 the virus of HIV, and it resulted in effective treatments that are today just astounding. Um, and we're and we're seeing that with with COVID as well, the vaccine development, and obvious obviously then the drug that we heard about just the other day. Um, I think that maybe the most important thing is the lessons that we've learned about communication. You know, things were changing rapidly, not as rapidly as they are with COVID, but things were moving quickly with HIV. People were afraid. Um, everyone was listening to what was being said. And we knew it would be, I mean, I, I think we knew that it would be dangerous if we pretended to know something we didn't know. Um, on the other hand, we wanted to give hope, but we wanted to make sure that people trusted what we were saying. And so if things changed, and we had to change our story tomorrow because the science had changed that we could do that without people distrusting us. Distrusting us. Um, and and I, think some, I think a lot of us learned how to do that pretty well uh, with HIV. And I think the people that are doing it now uh, with COVID are models of the same, of the same thing. I, I think of you know, people like Ashish Jha at Brown and Carlos Del Rio at, at Emory and, and, and others. Uh, that have learned how to do this in a way that I think instills trust. Well, Here's a couple. Of... Sorry, go ahead, Marcus. I was going to comment that the parallels between the epidemics early on, you know, AIDS in the first three or four years and COVID virus uh, epidemic in the first three or four months are, are uncanny. And going back as far as the Black Death, there are four things that you always see with an epidemic, and we saw them with AIDS, and we're seeing them with COVID. The first is the leaders want to deny that it's going to happen to uh, our, this country. You know, it's happening it, with, with, with HIV. It was only happening to faggots. It's not going to happen to Americans. It's not going to happen to real people. It's not going to happen to people who matter. It's only going to happen to them. And then, of course, the blame. You know, whose fault was it? 
well, it's those gay guys for what they're doing. If they weren't doing that, this wouldn't happen. With COVID, we're still blaming the Chinese. It may have started in China, but China responded appropriately, you know, and it doesn't make it go away if, if we uh, don't acknowledge, you know, that it doesn't matter where it started. What we've got to do is at attach the problem. And then you get the, the whole thing of loss of faith in, um, in, in institutions. You know, one of the major reasons for the Reformation after the Black Death was because the priests all died. Well, look at what happened with, with this. You know, we've changed how we approach bar, uh, uh, epidemics. We're now talking about we, we've got to set up a system where we can have a vaccine within a year for any new epidemic. Now, that's not going to be enough if it's a disease like AIDS where we still don't have a vaccine. But that's how we're beginning to think about it. And then as with any epidemic, the, the last thing that happens is inappropriate legislation or loss of trust in, in, uh, in, uh, in institutions. And, and look at the CDC. The CDC was badly wounded by what has happened with the COVID epidemic. And so we've seen the same thing over and over again. The, the FDA was badly wounded by how they first responded to the HIV epidemic. So yes, the parallels are there. And the next time when the epidemic begins, we should tell people, hey, watch out. The first thing you're gonna see is denial and blame and loss of faith in institutions and inappropriate legislation. It happens every time. Kathleen, why don't you make your comment, which is probably more COVID related, and then I had a different legacy comment. I ended up, uh, it's been fun or something to see all of, all, all of my old HIV mafia colleagues showing up in all of the COVID areas. And I think that that's not random. It's because many of us have this, this experience of the previous pandemic. So the things that I see as, as you know, being replicated, I was in charge of the vaccine program for my county, Alameda County, that includes Oakland and Berkeley, et cetera. And because of HIV, we involved community uh, organizations immediately in um, in the rollout of you know of the vaccine and vaccination mass vaccination sites were cited at churches and you know and schools and all the places that the community felt comfortable. I don't think that would have happened except for HIV. We also see a lot of citizen scientists. Um, I think that's you know that's part of what we've been talking about in terms of the legacy of Mar Marty Delaney and others that you know people who become trusted voices for different communities, even though they're not doctors, so that we can get past what Marcus was talking about in terms of the loss of faith in institutions. People still have faith in their communities and in certain voices. And the, the third thing I just wanted to mention, which I, which all of us know, is that, gosh darn it, you know, we're, we are still seeing the disparities. Again, we are seeing the disparities, you know, and that that's the part that we so much wish should be different should be different you know we should have learned about that from HIV, HIV how to do something different there but we haven't and so many more people of color have died and been severely impacted in COVID. I don't know what to make of that but I think it's the thing that I want to spend the rest of my career working on. I was just going to comment on kind of Marcus here or not um, Mike's comment about legacy and how it affects today, not so much COVID related, but primary care related, is that Ryan White kind of blazed beautiful trails in the patient-centered medical home, the health home, the um, whole person care arena that everyone's talking about now. That was kind of the secret sauce of the Ryan White program in my kind of observation and, and my, like, my um, career. And I would say that I was very honored to be a, a, a HRSA site visit consultant traveling all over the country and talking to people in every kind of city and rural area, consumer panels. And I would always ask like particular folks like, why, why haven't you gone to the big city? Why haven't you gone to, um, you know, a place where, you know, it's famous for being more accepting and those kinds of things. And uniformly across the country, every single time the answer was, this is my home. And this clinic is like a home for me. And I was so proud because I heard that so many times 
about Ryan White clinics, that the patients felt they were a home and a trusted area. And so what do we do with that in the COVID area, era of, you know, you have some very trusted entities out there. How can we leverage that? So we're at 30 minutes and we want to leave time for questions. And Dr. Cheever is going to moderate that for us. But, but as we sort of transition to that, maybe just quickly go around and say, we just talked about COVID, but in general, what, what are the personal lessons that you achieved from your experience starting off with HIV care that has carried you through your whole career? And Allison, maybe I'll start with you. Um, personal lessons that I think, I think what I've spoken about, the importance of recognizing um, my humanness, of learning about my own fears and the barriers that I carry within myself that interfere with my ability to care, to be a healer, to be a, a care provider, um, and that, that uh, hinder my uh, my ability to hear the concerns of others and to learn from them about what, uh, what caring and healing means to them. So th those, those are very, that on a grand scale is very important. And then, so then along with that, as, as you've all been alluding to the importance of, um, of going to people where they live, of, a, you know, where, of and the, enabling others who they trust if they don't trust us, to, um, to talk, to be, to uh, facilitate communication, to, uh, to bring them into a position where they feel, uh, they can feel cared for and they can partake of what we have to offer. Because we can have the best science and, and you know, care abilities in the world. And if, if uh, it needs to be a two-way two street. So. Michael, maybe I'll go to you next. Um, I would say something that has carried me through my career is what I've learned about um, the consumer voice. And I think Ryan White program was particularly good at raising a consumer's voice into the programming, their care with this activism thread woven into that. It was an, uh, an experience from Ryan White that I found fraught in terms of implementation globally, because culturally, there's a different, you know, each country has different aspects and approaches to consumer voice. Um, but to me, you know, we've spent, a, you know, eons building systems for ourselves. And, and Ryan White helped us think about how do we build systems for our consumers that meet them where they are, kind of what Allison was alluding to. So I'll, I'll stop there. Dr. Conan. The one thing I've learned is the job is never done. We can be very proud of what's been accomplished in the last 40 years. We can keep people alive now for normal life expectancy with the drugs that have been developed. But from my point of view, the job's still not done. Why in the world are we in the wealthiest country in the world not able to eliminate HIV AIDS in America? We could test everybody. We could treat everybody. We could test everyone coming into the country and we would eliminate that disease in this country and maybe be a model for the rest of the world. Why have we not done that? And I'd love to talk to anybody listening as to what are the reasons that we've not done that. And another way, every provider listening has his go-to regime. Sure, we, we tailor our antiretroviral regime, but there's some 30 drugs out there available in various combinations that we're using. What's the best regime? We don't know that because we can't do head-to-head -head trials. Why is that? And of course, if anybody should be advocating for head-to-head -head trials, it's us, the physicians. The drug companies aren't gonna do that. That, that undermines their, their very existence. And I guess the last job that I see that has not been done that AIDS points us to is we should be developing a national epidemic response plan so that the next epidemic, and there will be another one, we are prepared to respond to that. This one has only killed 2% of the population. As uh, um, was alluded to earlier, AIDS killed 94%. 
Right now, we've lost 700,000 men to COVID. If it had been 20%, we would have lost 7 million people by now. The doctors of the world are the ones that have to speak up. The politicians have a different audience. The drug companies have a different audience. The people listening to this program are the ones who can make a difference going forward. Dr. Clannon? I think, um... I think all of us, you know, are haunted by those, by that, I, in my mind, I think of it as the time of the great dying. And there was never a time when we got to declare victory against HIV, because as Marcus says, it's actually not done. It's still there. But uh, I think one of the lessons that I learned as a clinician is that my own history is a tool for working with my new patients, but it is not their history. And as much as I, you know, I see the 23 year old in front of me who's newly infected and you know, who's struggling to decide whether or not to take medication or maybe is kind of on it and off it. And you know, because of all the ghosts that I have in the room with me, I'm like, you're kidding me. I had all these people who died when we had nothing. And, you know, and part of me is like, you're worried about some side, this is ridiculous, you know, we can save your life. And the truth is that I don't get to do that. That's my history, it's not his. Um, and I think that what we have to learn about that is the limitations of what as medical institutions we can bring to people and where in order for people to trust us, we need to be more trustworthy about giving them the power to make their own decisions and the respect that they are people who are making decisions that may be best for them in some mysterious way, I don't know. So the history is really important for all of us to remember and it has limitations in how we apply it, I think in day to day. So um, I, I, my, I, I was afraid I was gonna be the first to be asked this question. <laughs> Fortunately, you went to Allison. Um, I would take this in a way different direction personally. Um, and maybe it's just where my head is at uh, right now. But, you know, I think some of us found ourselves thrust into a very visible position. You know, we had we're watching what we're doing and celebrating us to some degree mm -hmm. and, and all that. And I, I'm, I'm thinking these days about the regrets that I have um, about what I did that wasn't so good. We, we tend to remember ourselves in the most positive way possible. Um, I would, next time around, um, I'd, be, I'd be a much better partner uh, with my colleagues um, I wouldn't have taken so much myself. Um, uh, we have Connie Wassey today, um, and and, and I'd, I'd be a much better person with my family than I than I was. I was so distracted by all this. Um, so for the people that are kind of working with COVID, you, you know, some of you are going to find yourselves, you know, thrust in the middle of you know the whirlwind, and I would say. Eh, keep it under, keep it in perspective. Um, you can do good things. Other people can do good things, and you should work with other people um, uh, and give a lot of credit uh, where it's due. So I, I'm, I'm sort of dealing with some of that. Great. Well, thank you for all that. Those comments. Um, we have uh, many comments in the chat thanking everyone and, and talking about how wonderful this has been and, and some uh, specific questions. One is about if there were any African-American uh, providers in the early days of HIV. I know I had some great discussions with Dr. Scott in Oakland many years ago. He actually spoke at this conference uh, several years ago, um, but I don't know if others have names or people they want to bring into the, this discussion today. He was my go-to guy. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, yeah, uh, terrible, yeah. Yes, in Oakland, he, he was tremendous. Um, the other person, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say he was, you know, for all of us, Bob Scott, just a, just a tremendous, tremendous, and also kind of someone who already knew, <clears throat> pardon me, the lessons that Paul's talking about in terms of balance. Um, the other the other person that um, people were remembering was uh, Dr. Wolfstein. I don't know if you want to say anything about her, Paul. She died quite young. Yeah, well, I, I mentioned her just just now. Um, Connie was really, I mean, the two of us really started things. Um, it was, there was never, we never talked about it being, 
you know, collaboration or kind of multi-professional thing, but it was, you know, I was an oncologist. She was a, actually, she was typical at the time. She was ID, but she wasn't trained in ID. Um, very few people were. Uh, but Connie was, uh, was, was just a tremendous, way ahead of her time in terms of paying attention to women's issues at a time when women's issues in San Francisco and our epidemic were a small number, but still really important. Um, I think of Wilbur Jordan as well, you know, who, oh, yeah. you know, kind of, you know, solely kind of managed South Central LA and, and the AIDS epidemic and, and has done a, just a tremendous job with it. So there are great models, not, not enough. And I, I would like to acknowledge Connie as well. Really, we saw, we saw Connie Wafsi and, and Paul and Donald Abrams as kind of, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you were. Triune God. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they were a tremendous support to us when we started this, this unit. And so I, when I say we, I also want to acknowledge Cliff Morrison, who was the nurse yeah. who, who really started the unit, who, who brought it to fruition, who hired me and, and uh, the, all of the original nurses who started and, and the let's unit. put a plug in for the movie 5D, um, the documentary that Allison is definitely part of, Cliff is part of it. Um, I think it really, in, a, in an amazing way, shows what was happening and the thinking behind yeah. uh, the inpatient unit. Yeah, thank you, it, it really does. It's re and it's really a picture of what was happening at that time, the, the unit opened in July of 83. So that's 5B and you can, it was, it was commissioned by Johnson and Johnson and you can, you can find it on any platform. It's, it's, it is worth seeing, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, and there was a big shout out in the Q and A also about having uh, the role of nurses and having a nurse on the panel. And I think we'd all agree that nursing was just the core of so much HIV care um, in the earliest days and today as well. I mean, just a critical part of any program. Thank you. Um, there's another comment here just about what we actually know or think is the best. Will it be, is that necessarily true in the future as we learn more and more? And the example given is of, you know, really encouraging your, your patients to be on uh, nucleoside therapy because that was what was available and we, it, we would hold you over until the cure it wasn't going to be that great for very long, but it would help. And then when we had uh, really much better therapies in, the, in late 95 and 96, that then they didn't do that well because they didn't have a backbone on which to use their protease inhibitor. And so wondering similarly about some of these uh, man, like vaccine mandates and other things around COVID that that does seem to make the most sense now, but not really knowing what the long term will hold. So I think it has been humbling. I keep early on in, in, H, in, in COVID when I was speaking to our HRSA colleagues or at the department, I would reflect on my HIV and say, we think this is true today. This is the best information we have. But when we tell you something in two months or in two weeks, it's because we understand something differently or better and that you need to, you need to understand that. And I think so many of my, my patients with HIV do. I talk to them all the time, but you are a pioneer turning 70, having been on antiretrovirals for 30 years. You know, there aren't a lot of people in your shoes. And so we are learning as we go here and some humility as a clinician about uh, knowing that we are learning from our patients and we are learning as we go. And our patients being so um, generous in understanding that themselves and being open to that. Yeah, I, can, I, can, I, can I toss in something else? I just have to... Um, because we haven't really talked about uh, the community of clinicians and, and educators. And, and Michael uh, Reyes is an obvious great example of that. But you know, one of the one of the sponsors of the, of the program here at the Ryan White uh, Conference is the ISUSA, which has been you know some things I've helped worked with. You have, um, and you know, this idea that one of the one of the callings we have is to educate other professionals um, and, and definitely not just doctors, but everyone that's part of the team. But I think uh, the role of education is something that's really important to think of. Important for COVID, important for the next epidemic, but I think uh, that's, a, that's a key topic. Yeah, I, I really agree. And I think um, there's also the education, certainly of providers and nurses and, and, and pharmacists and, and uh, 
the entire team, and I think that's what came across from our discussion, is I think AIDS really catalyzed the notion of teams taking care of patients with patient-centered care. And I wasn't taught that uh, before. We sort of learned it together as we came along. But I think in addition to education, one of the things we're suffering through right now is that there is a challenge of education of, of all the team members in the medical field, but it's also education of the public. And the public doesn't quite get uh, what Dr. Cheever was just saying, that, and, and you alluded to this as well, that things change and, and COVID, they change almost every other week or every third week. And in the realm of politics, changing a policy based on emerging data they don't see the emerging data. They just see the policy change and say they've just flip-flopped. And that's a negative. And it starts to undermine the trust, as you were yeah, saying yeah. earlier. And that is a challenge that I don't think we've managed well. I don't know how to manage it because you try to be honest. You try to say, well, this is what we know as of the pres present. But people turn right around. Yeah, but three months ago, you were saying X. And that's because three months ago, we didn't know what we know today. I think we have to get... We have to ask the public's forbearance in that. You know, I think we, uh, I think this has to, it, this isn't pandemic or epidemic specific, this creating and developing this atmosphere of trust. I, you know, I think, you know, we've been talking about healthcare inequities and uh, I think that it, I don't know what you learn in medical school, but I think this is something foundational that we need to learn how to communicate with, with others who are diff from different cultures than we are, who speak, who, who, to whom words might mean, you know, have different uh, connotations than they do for us. We need to learn how to recognize those differences and, um, and, to acknowledge them and to reach out to people where they are and to employ the community groups, as you know, as you're alluding to, um, that are present to help us to create that, that uh, really foundation of trust. And, you know, it, I mean, it has to start in labor and delivery, you know, or it has to, it has to start from the very beginning because you can, you can be, we know that when it comes to a crisis, yeah, some people are on their best behavior, but some people are not. You know, some people can hear, but some people can only hear the voices of their fears. So we, you know, I, I think that the challenge is for all of us now who are in, involved in healthcare to to be setting the stage for the next dire um, dire occurrence. I would also add that in the, on the educational front, in the AIDS education and training center world, and actually on a whole person care project that Kathleen and I are working on, we're training in other skills such as consumer engagement skills. So how do you, you, you approach consumers, vulnerable consumers differently with motivational interviewing and really you know, steeping people in the concepts of trauma-informed care, which is impacting our most vulnerable population. So, I mean, we're constantly learning. And as you were all saying, you know, it's, it's an evolving um, dialogue, but those have become very um, important topics lately. I, I would just toss in that I, I think, you know, I think it was clear beyond any doubt that when some older, older elder statesmen were, were in our training that we de definitely didn't really have much focus on communicating with patients, especially across cultural barriers, um, or with communicating with other members of the, of the healthcare team. Um, I, I'd like to believe that that's better now. Um, and Laura might be able to comment. She's making a scowling face, like maybe it's not yet well enough. Uh, but at, at least I think it's 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 something that is on the table in terms of what we're talking about. Laura, yeah, let's... Had, yeah so we in HRSA have been really trying to get uh, sort of interprofessional teams as part of your training. So it's not something you learn the day you, you know, you're out on the wards or not even on the wards, the day you're in your Ryan White clinic for the first time, that it really needs to start even in education. And still it's very, very siloed. We're making a little bit of progress, but not great progress. And Ryan White is a great example of, of doing that differently. Um, the other thing that's come into the chat is just reflecting on how we've been talking about what, you know, this was what it was like in the early 80s. 
this person uh, spends quite a bit of time in Malawi and says it's really happening still globally today. This, this exactly what we're talking about. Uh, despite the work of PEPFAR and, and the Global Fund and others, it still is very dire in many places. That is correct. Yeah. Well, and, and before people get too depressed, I do want to comment that the Giants today clinched the division. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But, Just FYI, sorry for well, people from LA. But, but I, I think I think some things are are indeed universal, and uh, and and it is it is depending on access to care and the resources that are available. Um, if I can take off my moderator hat and just speak personally for a second, uh, one of the things is that our whole, entire clinic was modeled after the Ward eighty six and the inpatient service. Here, I spent one day. Uh, one day in December 1986 and asked one question, if you guys are starting over, how would you organize that? And that was the birth of the 1917 clinic. The other thing that I'd, I'd use very personally is most people know that in March of 2020, I contracted COVID coming back from New York. And, uh, and that was at a time when there was nothing, uh, very little known about the infection, not, nothing known about risk factors or progression. Just know that you, you don't want it to get worse. And you don't want to end up in the hospital. And I flash back to all my experiences over those 14 pretty horrific days of being sick with this to what it was like taking care of patients. I drew on the courage that the patients taught me of how to face unknown. I didn't know every night when my oxygen levels dropped to 90 or a little bit below, do I call 911 now or do I just tough it out? And I was able to tough it out but that courage I learned from patients that I took care of when the unknown was right around the corner and the unknown is by definition, the unknown. And the second thing I learned from them that I think did, I think a world of good was um, going public with the story, keeping the story to uh, people, to themselves um, was understandable, but the patients I think who had the most impact on changing the epidemic were those who talked to the media who went public um, or who became activists, much like Martin Delaney and others. Um, and I learned that. And so even from my, what I called Rikers Island, my little room in the house where I was isolated, uh, I would do radio and television and print interviews as much as my energy would allow because I thought it was important to get the word out. I learned that from taking care of HIV patients. And I, I want to publicly thank you guys for being such role models for all of us, because I don't think a lot of this patient-centric care generated, and not just here, but it was definitely here. That well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to flash for a second on comments that friends, colleagues of mine in New York City uh, made. So San Francisco, in, in, in many respects, we had it great. Um, you know, I don't mean that in any positive way exactly, but you know, it was a concentrated epidemic, it was a politically connected uh, community that, that it was affecting. Politicians were aware, we have a great health department. Um, and, but, but Jerry Friedland, who at the mm -hmm. time was in, in the Bronx said, you know, basically screw you, uh, all your media attention in San Francisco no one comes to the Bronx. We, we take care of, you know, men and women, all of color, all connected somehow to, to injection drug use, and no one's helping us at all. So I, I think, you know, that, you know, we talk about the San Francisco model and all that, but it's not that other people weren't trying to do it. It's just that we were given the blessing of, of resources that other people uh, didn't have. They, they were desperate to have the resources that we did. Yeah. I mention one other thing. It's, it's the importance of support. You know, we are not invincible. It, we, we, uh, it's, it's a tremendously, to see death after death. And I, I you know, I think of, of people taking care of the COVID patients now and like, you know, it hurts my heart, but um, it's, it's, it's also just wonderful work. It's, you know, it's work that we, that we've, we love, right? But we're not invincible. We need to take care of e ourselves and each other. Paul talked a little bit about balance 
But I think that's something else that should be taught that, you know, another gift we should be given in our education is uh, how do you recognize when you're burning out? How do you recognize when it's really, really getting to you? And how do you identify what support, sources of support there are for you? What works for you? And how do you insist that, uh, that the structure that you're operating in helps to provide you with the sources of support and education that you need. So, the, and once again, we were lucky. We had Shanti, we had wonderful social workers and we had a loving community, but, uh, but still, I think each, each of us has to define. You might describe what Shanti is. Shanti was an organization that provided practical support for cancer patients. Yes. And uh, with, in, in his wisdom, and, and so with the uh, advent of the epidemic, they became more active in HIV care, providing practical support in people's homes and emotional support. And Cliff Morrison, who started the unit in his wisdom, um, invited Shanti presence as you know staff members on the unit, both to speak with the with, with and for the patients, and then also to interact with staff. So that was a very important role. Well, and, and, and the social workers as well. Yeah, and, and, and Marcus, um, I, I remember your colleague, Paul Daig, who- Yes, Paul, I was gonna say Paul Daig, actually. Uh, and of course, Paul Daig did that. Uh, yep. a psycho yep. Psychologist bringing Shanti into HIV, and then he immediately developed CAPC sarcoma. It was really a tragedy. Yep. Well, so Laura, other comments from yes. the, So we do not really have any other questions in the Q and A um, at this time. I don't know if anyone, we have a little bit more time left if someone wants to ask. Laura, them. can I just make a comment about kind of other threads about how do you survive all this and how do you keep in the fight? And I've been very lucky in my career to be buoyed by the, the collegiality of the Ryan White program and the HIV clinicians and taking that into other realms of what we're doing. I get to work with these heroic people all the time and that has really helped me get through it. And I'm thinking, I'm speaking about the people that are attending this conference. Yes, and as we're closing, we had one more comment, just, uh, just bringing the Denver principles into the room as well where people with HIV came together to talk about if, if, if services were gonna be provided and care was gonna be provided, it would be including and in partnership and hearing the voices of people with lived experience. So absolutely agree with that. Um, also just uh, in the discussion about kind of resilience and learning that in um, medical school or nursing school or early in your career, there has been some new funding now to really work at the systemic level of, of, of really looking at burnout in terms of having uh, healthcare organizations have a sort of a culture of wellness for people that work in them, which is not exactly what occurs in most places now first. And then two, to really integrate that into the curriculum of nursing and pharmacy and medical schools so that as people are coming through, they understand that at, at a more basic level and don't have to learn it the hard way once you've burned out and gone down that deep, deep well. So, um, so those are two things that, that all of that funding really was as the result of this COVID uh, pandemic. So as you try to look at silver linings, that might be one of them that we really need to focus on it, not just at the personal level, but the level of organizations and systems. In which and most places have EAPs, employee assistance programs. It's yeah. just something to keep in the back of your mind. You can make a call and have someone to talk to. So I guess, I guess in the closing minute, uh, really a, a deep thank you to all of you for, for participating in this and bringing such uh, rich storytelling and lessons learned that I think uh, can instruct us all and, and how to move forward as new challenges hit all of us. But I, I think the things that I'm taking away is you never know what's going to happen the first day on your job or, um, <laughs> or soon after you start someplace or you're in the middle of school and a new something pops up and you got to be ready for it in a way and be flexible, but also be aware that the people around you um, are also involved and deeply affected and sometimes you get sucked into a vortex that you just don't have control over. And I think the lessons I'm hearing is take care of yourself in that process 
as much as you can. We're certainly learning that in COVID right now. And, uh, and that the future um, really is about adapting. And, and, but throughout all that, I think human nature is human nature. As Dr. Conant part pointed out how so many epidemics follow the same pattern, we don't tend to learn from it. I think it's not a question of learning. I think it's just people reacting in predictable ways. And it's really hard to change that. But at the same time, the heroism, the, the heart that is part of the response to HIV, um, I think is something we all draw from, uh, at least I know I do, I think all of us listening do, uh, that ability to sort of reach out, feel the patient's stories and try to somehow convert that energy and that passion into what we do every day. And I think that's what the Ryan White Care Act helps us enable. So thanks everybody for being here and, and for doing that. And, uh, Thank you, Dr. Peter.